greetings in the awesome and wonderful and magnificent, marvelous name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Welcome into the Wednesday night edition of Facebook Live Bible Study on behalf of the Mount Vernon Missionary Baptist Church, Auburn, Alabama. We are affectionately known as the Church on the Hill, MTV Holy Ghost headquarters where I have been privileged and honored to serve as pastor and CEO for the past 33, 34 years. I trust that God is moving miraculously in your life and you're walking in the favor of God and in the midst of trials and tribulations and vicissitudes, Mary Edwards, good evening to you, that, that you're walking in the blessings of God in spite of what's going on in your life. We attempted to do this broadcast on our normal normal Tuesday night broadcast, but we kept going in and out. So um, Evangelist Frazier was scheduled to teach tonight, but uh, she graciously acquiesced to let Pastor um, do this tonight and complete his study on James. Miss Yvonne H. Whitfield, God bless you, recuperating nicely from her surgery. Uh, God bless you, and we'll continue to keep you in our prayers. Okay, uh, we are studying the book of James. Uh, we are completing uh, the uh, epistle of James. Remember that James uh, is the, was the brother of Jesus, and James is writing to some Messianic Jews. Mary Thomas, good evening to you and to your family. Uh, call a neighbor, call a friend, and tell them that MTV's live is on MTV's Facebook page. Okay, James is the brother of, of Jesus, or was the brother of Jesus. Uh, Dean Carl Brown, good evening to you. And the last time we were with James, uh, James was teaching, uh, criticizing the uh, rich people for abusing uh, the poor people. Re remember, James is prover proverbial. It's kind of like the Proverbs, and good evening to you. And he also borrows, um, he also uh, echoes Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. So James is basically practical uh, principles, if you will, for living. Uh, we are con uh, concluding James tonight, hopefully, and we're in James chapter number five. Robert, good evening to you, my brother. We're in James chapter number five, and we will deal with verses seven through verse 20, seven through 20 tonight. And we're going to look at, uh, James teaches us something about patience. James teaches us something about, uh, promises or making promises. And then thirdly, James teaches us something about prayer. Those are the major points, uh, patience, uh, pro uh promises and prayer. Here in uh, verse, verse 7a and 8a, James, noted what he does, Miss Margaret Bozeman, James admonishes the church people to be patient. Look at 7a, be patient, therefore, brethren. You remember whenever you see the word brothering in the Bible, it means that he's, it's family talk. It means that he's talking to those of us who are born again. Janice Finley, good evening to you. He says, be patient, therefore, brethren. Look at verse 8a, eight, be ye also patient. And he tells you in 8b how, uh, what mechanism there is for you to establish your patience. He said, establish your hearts. In other words, in, 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 in a word, have your heart in tune with God, and if your heart, if you establish it in your heart that you are going to be patient, then patience will come to pass. It will come to fruition. Uh, let's go back to verse seven. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. First of all, James is writing to those persons who have been persecuted and misused by the rich people. So what James is saying, Mary Thomas, James is saying, Learn to be patient in your tribulation. While you are going through, continue to trust in God. Don't faint, don't lose faith, don't stop trusting in God because you must understand uh, the devil's ultimate goal 
is to get you to turn against God. The devil doesn't mind you being broke. The devil will uh, uh, wreak havoc in your life uh, uh, that results in, bro in brokenness <laughs> because his desire to get you to turn against God. Miss Enet Reese, good evening to you. The devil doesn't mind you being sick. The devil doesn't want you necessarily sick. The devil wants you sick so you can turn against God. The devil wants you going through trouble because the devil believes that, like he told you, <laughs> like the devil said under Job, um, 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 God let me get at him and get at his stuff and let me cause trouble and he will turn against you. That's the devil's philosophy. The ultimate goal of the devil is not to get you sick. It's not to get you burdened. Uh, but the ultimate goal of the devil is to get you to turn against God. That's what it means. That uh, that's what it means when it says, "No weapon formed against me shall prosper." It does not mean trouble is not going to come. Devil. The Bible clearly tells us Psalm Psalm twenty four, John sixteen, um, um, uh, Job fourteen. All tell us that we're going to go through trouble, Doctor Tina Holloway. So I mean, so to suggest that no weapon formed against you mean that that you're never going to go. Through through trouble is counter to what the Bible says. We will go through tribulation, but what James is saying here is, I want you to continue to endure, to hold on to your faith, to trust God while you are going through tribulation. Romans 12 and 12, he clearly says, hang in there while you are going through trouble. Why? Because things tend to get better. So first of all, James admonishes us, to be patient in tribulation because trouble troubles do not last to what David said uh, 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 about trouble. David said in Psalm 27, 13 and 14, he said, I would have given up. I would have quit. I would have turned around had I, had I not believed that I would see the goodness of God on this side. OK, David said, no, trouble is going to stop. Trouble is going to get better on this side. Miss Manetta, good evening to you. He, uh, uh, so uh, um, um, Isaiah 40 and 31 said, they that wait upon the Lord, the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings of an eagle, run and not uh, uh, faint, uh, uh, run and not be weary, walk and not faint. There is a blessing in waiting on and being patient on God while you are going through, Kim White, good evening to you, while you are going through your tribulation. And even if things, Understand me, even if things do not get better on this side, we have an assurance that where we are going, because we have established in our heart, we've invited the Lord Jesus into our heart, and we've established that going back is not an option, that backsliding is not an option, that not, faith, not having faith and trust in God are not options. Glory to God. So we look for a brighter day on the other side. Yes, we want to, uh, uh, to fulfill our life here, but we understand that where we are going is better than where we are. The old folks said it this way. The, the old folks said this way. This world is not my home. I'm just a stranger bunny traveling on borrowed land. And we need to get back to longing for heaven. We need to get back to teaching people to understand that yes, we want to live down here, but living down here is not our ultimate goal, beloved. Our, our ultimate goal is to when we die, to go be with him. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Heaven is much better than earth. I know you all are used to every sermon you hear talking about how to get better down here, how to do better down how to get, but heaven is better than earth. Let me say that again. Oh, uh, the old folks said, Miss uh, Bernay, where the streets are paved with gold, <laughs> glory to God, where every day will be like Sunday and Sabbath will have no end. Revelation chapter 21 talks about, it. John said, man, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, Evangelist Fraser, for the first earth, heaven and earth were passed away. He said, there shall be no more seed. Seeds men are uh, 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 separated people. He said, there will be no more separation. And then he said, and God over there, God, there will be no no more tears. God will wipe all tears from our eyes. Our ultimate goal is to make it where Jesus is. He says, I'm John 14. He says, I'm going away to pay a place for you. I'm coming back to get you. 
He's he going to prepare a place for a prepared people, but we must be patient in our tribulation. Romans 8 and 18, Paul said this. Paul said, regardless of what I'm going through now, it's nothing compared to what I'm going to get when I get to heaven. I'm going to put on my shoe and walk around heaven all day, singing the heavenly choir. Every day will be like Sunday. We must get back to understanding that had been appointed unto man once to die after death is coming the judgment. We must get back for people to long, glory to God, for heaven and not necessarily to put our hope in heaven on earth because heaven where we are going is greater than anything than we can have here on earth. So first of all, James admonishes us to be patient in trouble. Secondly, he uh, admonishes us to be patient with people. Verse number nine, he says, he says, complain not against one another. In other words, he's telling the church, y'all stop mummering and grummering and fussing and fighting and judging one another. Why? Because when you judge, when you point your finger at, at, at your brother, you got four pointing back at you. Glory to God. He's saying, cut that foolishness out. Stop fussing, fighting, arguing about this and about that in the body. Why? He said, because the judge standeth at the door. That goes back to the end of verse number seven, um, uh, uh, seven a, where he said, "Be patient, therefore, brethren." Why? Because the Lord is because of the unto the coming of the Lord. Look at verse number eight. Be be ye also patient, establish your heart. Why? For the coming of the Lord draweth now. Now look at verse 9. Gr uh, complain not against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Why? Because the judge standing at the door. What he's saying is, he's saying is, he's saying we ought to live, glory to God, every day like it's our last day, like, like Jesus is coming back. I think I told you last week, somebody asked the question, what would you do if you knew Jesus was coming back tomorrow? I would do the same thing I've been doing. Glory to God. Why? Because I fixed it up with Jesus. I'm not going to be perfect when he comes, regardless to what I'm doing. And I'm not saved by my works. I'm saved by my faith in him. He says, Jesus is at the door. He's, his, his imminent return is near. He's coming back at a church, a church that without, that's without spot nor wrinkle. The question is, will you be ready? Will you be ready when the Lord returns to go back? Have you made preparation to, to go to the prepared place that he has prepared for us? He said, man, be patient in your tribulation. Be patient with people and be patient with uh, 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 because no and be patient because no man knoweth the day or the hour when the Son of Man shall return. But we do know one thing: He's coming back, and He's coming back, Miss Anna Reese, as a thief in the night. When we are less least expecting it, the Lord will return. And blessed are those, praise God, beloved. Blessed are those of us who are prepared, who have oil in our vessel, <laughs> trimmed <laughs> and waiting on his return. So number one, he teaches us, uh, he says, be patient in tribulation, be patient with pe be patient in problem and be patient with people. And then he gives us some examples that we can look to for faith. Okay. The first example is a farmer. Go back to verse number seven. I will exegete the take. Verse number seven, be patient. Therefore, brethren, so he's talking to the church folk. Unto the coming of the Lord, he is coming back. Behold, he said, take a look at the farmer. And he said, the farmer waited for precious fruit of the earth and have long patience for it until he received the early and latter rain. He's saying, he's saying, if you're getting impatient, just think in terms of a farmer and wait on your change, wait on your blessing, wait on the promises of God, just like the farmer waits for his harvest. Now, how does the farmer wait for the harvest? He, he is expecting a harvest because he understands Genesis 8, 22. God has established seed time, harvest time. God has established seed time and harvest time. God has established a time 
to plant and a time to pluck up. Now, a farmer does not expect a harvest where he has not planted. And many of you are missing out on a whole lot of harvesting is because you are trying to reap a harvest where you have not planted. The Bible says, God in our mark, what sort of a man plant that he shall get up. He, he going to reap what you sow. If you have not planted yet, why in the world are you sitting around looking at the field talking about I'm waiting on my crop to grow? No, you should have no expectation of a harvest if you have not planted. Glory to God. Let me say that again. If you have not planted a seed, you cannot realistically, if, if you're in your right mind, <laughs> expect a harvest. However, if you have planted the seed, then you, and, and it was a good seed and it was in fertile ground and, 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 and you waited on the first water because the, uh, because, because the first rain uh, uh, made the ground moist enough for you to plant, you're waiting on the latter rain, then you have an expectation. Glory to God. The Bible says give. Luke 6, 38. Check this out. Give and it shall be given unto you. Press down, shake it together. Shall men give unto you. If you hadn't given, men ain't going to give into your bosom. And what I'm saying is, if in fact you have planted good seed in first soil, then, then all you have to do is trust the process. Is trust the process is trust. Even when the farmer is waiting, he has to trust the process. He has to trust the sun to shine. He has to trust God to send the rain because those things are out of his control. What am I saying? I'm saying only, only glory to God, only be concerned. And I, I'm, I'm, I and maybe you shouldn't be concerned. Only be concerned about that, which you can't control. You can control what, um, um, what, what seeds you plant. You can control what the soil is. You can control that. You can even control tilling the ground, but you cannot control the rain. You cannot control the sun. That's in God's hand. And that's how you wait. Waiting does not mean sitting down passively. Oh my God. Uh, all I got to do is pray and speak another tongue and something's going to happen. No, faith without work is dead. Faith without work is dead. Glory to God. But but once you have to handle your business, focus on what you can control, then you wait. Now, how do you wait? You wait like the old folk waited. <laughs> the old folk had this system where uh, at the first of the month, when the male man brought the check, if you if if he if you live in the in, in, in a place where he brought your check first. You get on the phone and tell my grandmama, yeah, he, uh, he, he on the way. And they were always looking out the window for the eagle to fly. That's what they call payday, the eagle fly. All right. That's how you wait on God with an expectation. Why? Because he's at the door. Now, theologians and biblical scholars and writers and, and the church have been saying we living in the last days ever since Jesus left. Now, if we, are we living in the last days now? I don't know. Nobody know. The Bible said nobody. Now, there are some signs that say we are closer to the last day than we've ever been as, as time tick on. But he's saying, look at the farmer. Trust the process. What's the process? Trouble come to teach you patience. James 1, 2 and 4. What's the process? We know that all things work together for the good to them that love God, to those that are who call, who are the be called according to his purpose. What's the process that we got to trust? Romans, uh, I mean, Galatians, uh, um, 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 oh my God, what am I looking for? One of Tanya's oh, fav uh, fa favorite scriptures um, um, that thank not. Galatians 6, 9. Be not weary. Here it is. Be not weary in well doing. In other words, don't stop doing good. He said, because you will reap in due season. And it's time for some of you due season. And you need to just start speaking it right now. Now, I'm not into this name it and claim it. But if, in fact, you have handled your business, then you can speak it. If, in fact, you have planted, you have done what you're supposed to do and handled your responsibility, he says you shall root, reap in due season. And for a lot of you, it's your due season. You can claim it. You can name it. You can prepare for it because it's your due season now. And some of us are walking 
in our due season as it relates to prosperity. Now, we're not walking in our due season yet as it relates to our health. It's not walking in, in our due season as it relates to our praying for our children. I mean, there are a lot of areas where we are still planting seeds for our due season. But for many of us, my netta, for many of us, Mary, for many of us, and we are walking in our due season right now. I mean, all of our bills are paid. We are not listening to this phony baloney, all this God, or uh, all this uh, 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 overnight uh, uh, success and overnight money coming now. No, money has already come now because we paid our time. Dr. Gina, Jenny Boyden, good evening to you. We managed our money well and we trusted in God and, and we are now walking in our due season. We are walking in overflow. As a matter of fact, most of our bills are on automatic pay. We don't even have to call anybody. They deduct it out of our bank account. Why? Because we were patient with God and God was faithful. Most of us now are making more money than we've ever made in our life. Now we need to, now we need to move from, from, from walking in our prosperity to walking in healing and walking to our, and walking to our children being more of what God wants them to be. Devil, we'll trade in this prosperity if our children would just spread, if our if our children would just straighten up and fly right. We would trade in health if our children would just straighten up and be what God wants them to be. But we're not going to give up. James said we've got to be patient with them. Why? God was patient with us, so we're going to be patient with them. We're not going to stop fussing. We're not going to stop preaching. We're going to stop cussing. But, uh, uh, but other than that, we are going to stay before God until change happens in our children's lives. Teresa, good evening to you, Evangeline. And until change happens in our children's life, we're going to stay before God. We're going to stay on our faith. We're going to continue to pray. We're not going to give up and say it is what it is. The devil is a liar. It ain't what it ain't going to be. He says, look at these farmers and just trust the process. Glory to God. I'm just trusting the process. Oh my God, in that we just trusting the process. Don't you dare. I don't know why God's sending me down there. Don't you dare give up on that child. I don't care where that child is. I don't care if the child is in that, is in that pig pen of light. Don't you give up on that child. You just keep on praying. And one day he or she are going, he or she, oh my God, he or she will, is going to come. They may have a little hog slap on them, but they're coming back. <laughs> Just, just, just get you a rag and, and, and some water, wipe the hog slop off them and move on. Don't you dare. I don't, I don't know who I'm talking about. Don't you dare give up on your child. I don't care where. I, he, he could be in jail. He could be under the bridge. He could be on crack. He could be, I don't, she, I don't care. Don't you dare. Stop praying for your children. All right, be patient with them like mama and them was patient with us. <laughs> oh my God. They were patient with us. We were rebellious and hard headed and wouldn't listen and, and glory, gl glory to God. So that nothing new under the sun. Okay. All right. So he said, look at the farmer. That's the first example. The second example is he says, look at the prophets. Where are you? I'm in verse number 10. I'm going to exegete this text. Verse number 10. He said, take my brethren, the, take my brethren, church folk, uh, the prophets. What did they do? Here it is. Who have spoken in the name of the Lord. That, that's what a prophet is. Okay. A uh, no, that's, uh, that's a priest. A priest is a bridge builder. The prophets speak to people for God. The priests speak to God for the people. Okay. All right. The prophet to my Jeremiah, Isaiah, uh, Hosea, Amos, Obadiah, those prophets. He said they suffered affliction, but they hung in there. He says if they could go through hell, and hang in there, Miss Di Diane Harris Preston. We could go through trouble in hell and hang in there. They set they they set a standard that says I am not going back. Why? Because nothing back there <laughs> but trouble. Who wants to go back to that life of sin? It's better over here. Now that may be more hell and confusion and trouble, but that but but we all bought into that. Okay, it's still better over here than it is over there. Okay, he says, 
Look at the prophets. Verse 11. Behold, we count them happy, or the same word that we get the word blessed, God like joy. We count them happy, which endure. He said, man, if you hang in there, peace is coming. Peace will come, but you got to hang in there. Be not weary in well-doing. Lay 6, 9, don't stop doing good now. I know it looked like it ain't paying off. It seemed like the more good you do, the more trouble you have. It seemed like the more folk you help, the more people lying and talking about you. That's okay. And it gets frustrating. And our next, our next example is going to prove it gets frustrating. Okay? Verse ver number 11. He gives the third example. He said, you've heard of the patience of Job. I got some problem, Pat, with the patience of Job. Okay, James uses him as an example, so, that, so, so that's cool. But here's what I want you to know about Job. Job's patience was not perfect. And I'm, and I'm getting ready to free somebody because, see, these super saints, Ann and Evangelist Frazier, want us to think that we unsaved, and, I mean, we less sanctified and we less spiritual when we have bad moments of depression and frustration and even doubting God. Oh my God, yes, all of us. I don't care how saved and sanctified you are. You will have moments where you're not as full of faith as you need to be. Job did Job lost everything he had. Seven son, three daughters. He um, lost all his houses, land, cows, goats, sheep, lost everything. Wife came to him and said, man, look at you. You are nobody now. Look at your God. Curse God and die. Job never cursed God. Job, Job said, naked I came into this world. Bless him. Naked I came out of I, Naked I came out my mother's womb. Ne naked I'm leaving. But Job, patience was not perfect. He lost everything. Even, uh, uh, even his friends came and said, look, man, you sin somewhere. Turn to Job chapter 3. I want to show you these people are human. The only super saint there was was Jesus Christ. Every other one was flawed. David always had pity parties. Lord, my enemy tried to get me. Lord, you left me. But then he turned right around and said, but I'm going to trust in you. <laughs> oh, my God. God, what am I? Look at Job 3. This is the man that James just said is an example of faith. Faith wasn't perfect. I'm, I'm sorry. Example of patience. Patience wasn't perfect. Look at verse 1. After this, Job, uh, this when Job had lost everything. After this, and it even said, naked I came and naked I shall return. After this, opened Job his mouth and cursed, not cussed, not profanity. Curse the day he was born. Wait a minute. I thought that brother had so much patience. Job, Job is, his patience was imperfect. Job cursed the day he was born. Verse two. And Job spake and said, let the day wherein I was born and the night in which it was said, you got a boy for a child. Let that day be darkness. Let not God regard it from above. Neither let the light shine upon it. This brother is having a pity party in the midst of his patience. You got to understand this brother done lost everything. This brother done lost. Lord have mercy. This brother has lost everything. And, and, and to suggest to Job that he shouldn't be sorrowful, be sorrowful because his kids died. It's crazy. And to suggest he ought to be, he, and, and to suggest that because God gave him 10, I mean, 10 or 20 more children replaces the previous 10, it's stupid. I don't care how many children you got. If you lose one, you get another one. That doesn't replace the one you lost. Job, Job is heartbroken. He's still trusting God, but the brother is heartbroken. Verse five, let the darkness and the shadow of death stain it. 
Let the cloud dwell upon it. Let the blackness of the day terrify it. And then he goes on for chapter after chapter after chapter, complaining, sorrowful, depressed. Now, God does not want us depressed, but there are periods of time where we are not going to exhibit perfect faith. Go to and now, now go to chapter 38 of Job. I mean, sometimes y'all need to read the rest of Job. Job was just pity potting and boo-hooing for 30 some chapters and God just listened to him. And then in chapter 38, listen to what God does. Then after all that complaining and boo-hooing and la, 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 woe is me, groove, despair, hang out, la, 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 la. Then the Lord answered Job out of a whirlwind and said, who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Job, what in the world are you yapping about? Gird up now thy lion's loins like a man. Get up, Job, for I will demand of thee and answer thou me. See, God, Job had been answered. God, Job had been answering God all, all of these questions about what's going on in life. So God said, okay, you, done call, you have called me in the council. Now let me call you in the council. He said, verse four, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? As if I don't know what I'm doing. Declare if thou can answer, if thou understand it. Who, verse five, who have laid the measure thereof if thou know it? That's a question. Or who has stretched the line upon it? Then he goes on to ask, I, I mean, to basically call Job into question. The point I'm trying to make is, yes, Job is an example of patience, but please understand he did not have perfect patience. Glory to God. Wow, I spent all my time almost on patience. On patience, verse 7 through 11. That's the first point. Be patient in tribulation. Be patient with people and look at those th three examples. The second point is he teaches us about promises. I just get as far as I can. Okay, as we exegete the text. Uh, let me, let's get back to James. Oh, my God. What a mighty God. What a mighty God. We serve Hebrews being James. Okay, James 5. Now, let's look at the promise. Verse number 12. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. He teaches us on promises. Verse number 12. But above all things, my brother, swear not, swear not, swear not. And that means take an oath. Neither by heaven nor by earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea and your nay be nay, lest you fall into uh, condemnation. What is he saying? He's saying here is that you ought to be a person of your word, that people ought to know you and know that if you say you're going to be there, you're going to be there. If you say you're going to do it, going to do it. If you say I'm going to pay the bill, you're going to pay the bill. If you say I'm coming to choir rehearsal, you're at choir rehearsal. If you say I'm joining the church and coming to church, you're at the church. Mean what you say. You're right, Manetta. Mean what you say. Say what you mean. But what had happened was the Pharisees and the scribes and the Jews in general had created this elaborate way of lying. This And so what they would do of uh, turn to Matthew chapter number, where is it? Matthew chapter number five, I think it is. Matthew chapter number five, verse number 34. They had created this uh, elaborate way of basically lying. That, that is to say, um, look at verse number 33, Matthew five. He says, again, you've heard that it had been said of old of them, thou shalt not forswear that forswear thyself. In other words, Leviticus 19 and 12 says, God, God says, don't lie to me. Don't, if you go, don't make me a vow, a, a promise, and you don't keep the promise, okay? Now, he's not condemning us making promises, okay? Because whenever you go buy a car, you promise to pay the note. A house, I mean, he, he, uh, he's, he's not talking about that. He's, talk, he's condemning, you have to look at the context. He's condemning this elaborate system of lying that the Jews had created. All right, and, 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 and notice this, but thou shalt not forswear, but thou shalt perform unto the Lord thine oath. Okay, verse 34, but I say unto you, swear not at all. He's condemning this, this, uh, this elaborate way of lying, neither by heaven, 
or it's God's throne. What the Jews were saying was, you can swear by heaven, but don't swear by God. And what he's saying is, don't even swear by heaven. Why? But it may not be God, but it's where God's throne is. Because, see, what they were trying to do is to swear and not invoke God. So, so if I would swear by heaven, if I would swear to pay you, I didn't have to pay you because that wasn't binding. What was binding was if I swore by God. This was the elaborate thing. Not, or I could swear by earth. He said, but don't do that either because you can't keep God out of that because it's his footstool. Neither by the city of Jerusalem. Why? Yeah, uh, it's the city of the great king. Neither shall you swear by your head, because you cannot, because you cannot make your hair black or white. No, then he goes back again. But let your communication be yes, yes, nay, nay. Well, forever. Now, what he's saying is, if I have to prop up what what I say with a I swear for God, that means you don't believe me if I just tell you I'm going to do it. If I say, <laughs> I, I remember when I was working at Second Chance as a counselor, I, it, it should have been called Last Chance, but it was Second Chance. And uh, the guys would always tell me, uh, 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 Miss Preach, no, they, they call me Preacher. Preacher, I, I, I put that on my mama life as if I'm going to believe them because they put it on their mama life. Or I put that on my neighborhood or I put that on God. What that mean? That mean I don't trust you to just say this is what happened or that happened. And what he's saying here is you don't have to make promises like that. When you when you are walking in integrity, if people believe you and you are not perceived as a liar, you don't have to say, I swear on my mama grave. This is the thing that he's condemning. He's not condemning saying, I promise I'm going to be there. But I mean, well, well, yes, he is. Because he said, you ain't got to say I promise. Just say, yes, I'm going to be there. Yes, I'm going to do it. No, I'm not going to do it. Yes, I'm going to date. Yes, I, yes, yes or no. He's saying just, just walk in integrity. Well, wow, when are church folk going to learn to just say what you mean and mean what you say? Most of us can take a no. Most of us, okay, if you're not going to do it, just say you're not going to do it. But don't lie and say, I'm, I'm going to. Now, I understand sometimes things come up. You know, you, you say you're going to do something. And so, so then you ought to call and say, look, something came up. I'm not going to be able to do what I said I was going to do. And I'm not even going to get into borrowing money. I'm not. Tamara, Yancey, good evening to you. I'm not going to even get into that. But what he's saying on the promises is because God. And, and I know where they get I swear for God from. Because God swore by himself. Hebrews 6.13 said God couldn't find no one greater than him. So God swore by himself. Oh my God. <laughs> Lord have mercy. So, he, uh, so, so the challenge under when he teaches us about promises, don't make promises. Just, I mean, don't make those kind of promises. Just let your word be your bond. Just walk in integrity. If you say you're going to do it, do it. If you say you're not going to do it, then don't do it. Let your yea be yea, your nay be nay. Anything other than that implies that you don't, be, that, that you don't believe I'm a person of integrity, integrity and you can do what I say. And, and, and you can believe what I say. Okay, that's um, the patience in verse 7 through 11. In James 5, that's the promises. Verse 12, now, that, now he teaches us something about prayer. Verse number 13. Okay. Is there any among you afflicted? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, notice what he tells the, those who are afflicted, those who are going through to do. Let him pray or let her pray. Now, now, now. So first of all, he, he's saying you need to pray for yourself. Check it out. Let him pray. Beloved, you've got to learn how to pray for yourself. He's going to tell them, it's all right to have people praying for you. It's all right to have your pastor praying for you. But you may need me to pray for you, and I'm at Planet Fitness working out. So you need to pray for yourself. Every child of God needs to know how to have a talk with their daddy. Every, every one of you. And I mean... And see, we've complicated prayer. All you got to do is just talk to God. God, 
Hi, God, I love you, God. I, I, I here, 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 here's the problem. God, work it out for me. You know how to go. This evening, our heavenly Father. Really, just talk to God. Just tell God, ask God, praise God, worship God. But if you're afflicted, you are praying to be unafflicted. <laughs> oh my God! Pray for yourself. You don't have to come to me to get to God. He tore down the petition. Yes, back in the day of, of, of Judaism, they had to go to the priest. But the Hebrew writer says we have a high priest. Oh, my God. In the form of Jesus the Christ, who is greater than Melchizedek, who was the high priest and king of Salem. That's right, Mary. Learn to pray for yourself. Don't make it complicated. Just talk to God. Okay. He says, so number one, he says, pray for yourself when you're afflicted. He said, is, is, is any merit? Let him sing song, song. Well, obviously, he said, pray in good times and pray. I mean, bad times, but then you ought to pray in good time. Pray while you're singing. Let him be merry. Let him sing a song. We tell y'all all, all, all the time. All, 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 I'm studying. He tell y'all all the time, every child of God ought to know how to pray. Every child of God ought to have a song. <laughs> oh my, down in your bosom. Glory to God. That, that, that magnifies, glorifies God and makes you feel better about your, what you're going through and about your relationship. One of my favorites is never would have made it. Mm. And, and, and y'all know I won't complain. I, I have several favorites that when I'm going through, God knows all I got to do is play that song and it will make me feel better. Glory to God. It will, it picks me up. Okay. It picks me up. Now, sometimes, now, now, sometimes I'm depressed. I go listen. I agree. <laughs> Probably should tell y'all that, but I do. I go listen. I agree. Uh, and that just feeds the depression. I, I mean, and I don't mind telling y'all, I suffer from seasonal depression. Praise God. Well, well, pastor, you shouldn't claim that. Well, I ain't claiming that. It's a reality. People get people get on my nerves, and I'm getting all of my subject. Talk about don't you claim sickness, but yet they're going to the doctor. Don't you dare say you got cancer, but I'm going to chemo. I'm going to chemo. If I ain't got cancer, why am I going to chemo? Duh. <laughs> I suffer from seasonal depression. God knows I'm saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost. Okay, and during the holidays, I get depressed, and I go and turn my Al Green on and. And then and, and my family leave me alone and, and uh, you know, and that doesn't make me feel any less than being saved. David went through depression. Job obviously was going through some mental anguish. So don't allow people to make you feel less than a saint because you have bad days, because you have depressive days, because you have down days. And, and let me be honest, there are, there, there are times when we are, when those who are of, of, of us who are saved, we don't want to hear scriptures. That's wrong. We, we don't want to hear the scriptures. We don't want to pray. We just want to have our pity party. Oh, never left you alone. By, <laughs> it wasn't talking about never left you alone by Billy Rivers and Love Fellowship Crowd. Oh, oh, okay. That's your song. Okay. All right. And... and and hopefully I'm helping somebody. You're not the Lone Ranger. When you go through moments of anguish and moments of depression, just don't allow your depression to turn into despair. Glory to God. Get over it. Get a grip. Okay. Um, he said, sing a song if you're happy. Then he said, and verse 14 had been the controversy of a lot of theological controversy. Okay. Okay. He says, verse 14, is any sick among you? Well, yeah. Let him call for the elders. Not sure who the elders are there because sometimes the word elder is for the church leaders. Sometimes it's for the old people. Sometimes it's for those who are spiritually mature. I'm not sure who, who, who they refer to there. Okay, um, so I'm not going to isogee the text and pretend like I do, but 
call for somebody from of the church. <laughs> we know they are at the church. Um, I think in the Septuagint, the word there is called for the congregation. So I'm, I'm not sure who the elders mean there. Um, he said, and let them pray. And he, here's another thing we know, that they know how to pray. So call for some people from the church who know how to pray. Now, I got to be careful with that now because folk don't want you at their house. So make sure they call in you. Okay. Noted what he said. If you sit, call for the elders. We get mad when the preacher just don't show up. Call. He said, call him. Send for him or her or them. You didn't even come see me when I was sick. I don't know you sick. Oh, my crystal ball. Yeah, right. Okay. Is there any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him. Anointing him with oil. Now, in, 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 at this point in history, the oil serves their medicinal, medicinal, medicinal purposes. Okay? This ain't the Holy Ghost. Every time you see the word oil, it doesn't mean the Holy Spirit. Now, the, now the, the Bible used the oil as Holy Spirit, yes. But every time you see the word oil, it doesn't mean the Holy Spirit. It mean literal oil. Put some oil on them. Makes them feel better. Okay? In the name of the Lord. Okay? And the prayers of faith shall save the sick. Now, th there's controversy here because there are some denominations that teach that everybody can be healed and this verse proves it. Well, that really ain't true. Okay, you have to put scripture on scripture. Hermeneutic consistency. If in fact this worked all the time all you had to do was go to the hospital, lay hands on folk, and everybody in the hospital would get well. And let me ask you a question. If everybody is supposed to be healed, when would anybody die? I mean, if, if I mean, you know, there are going to be times when you're going to pray, you're going to lay all on them, and they're not going to get up. They're going to die. Because it ain't God's will. Okay? And the Lord shall raise him up and if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven. Now, because it says, if, if he have committed sins, they should be forgiven. Some teach that he's talking about spiritual saving, spiritual healing, getting right with God. Okay. Which is right. I don't know. <laughs> okay. First John 5, 14 and 15 says, this is our confidence in our prayer. That if we ask anything according to his will, we shall have it. Okay? Verse 16. You really got to really be careful about this one. Confess your faults one to another. He's talking about prayer partners. You ought to have somebody in your life that you can just be real with. And say, boy, I blew that one. And then y'all pray for one another. And here it is, that he may be healed. Now, he's probably once again talking about um, spiritual healing. The effectual prayer of the righteous availeth much. There's a lot of controversy as to whether or not this verse is talking about physical healing or spiritual healing. Pastor, which one is it? I don't know. Oh, I don't know. Maybe it's both. When I may, maybe, maybe it's referring to the one that's needed. If you need physical healing, talking about physical healing. If talking about if you need spiritual healing, you're talking about spiritual healing. Okay, yeah, I mean, that's a good way for me to say that possibly that's what it means, okay? I don't know, your guess is good as mine. Verse 17, Elijah was a man subject to like passion as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might rain. He gives another example. Elijah prayed it rained, he prayed again that it didn't rain, okay? That just tells you the power of prayer. Verse 19, brethren, if any of you do error from the truth, and one convert him. Now, see, that means that, 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 once again, that almost implies that he's not talking about physical, but, but spiritual. Okay? But I'm not sure. Okay? Uh, and convert him. Verse 20. Let him know that he which converted the sinner from the error of his way. Obviously, talking about spiritual there. Shall save a soul from death, being separated from God eternally, and shall hide the multitudes of sin. So if you take that in its context, in its totality, you could understand why there are so, some who say he's really talking about 
spiritual healing there. And then others say he's talking about physical healing. And then I guess we can say it could possibly be, vac be vacillating between physical healing and spiritual healing. Okay. That's it. That We are completed. We have completed the book of James. We actually broadcast from the Mount Vernon Missionary Baptist Church Facebook page. And it looked like we didn't have any trouble until people were trying to call me. Okay. That's it. That's the book of James. I'm not sure where we're going. If there's a book that you all want, want, would want to suggest that we study, I'm not going to Revelation, so don't even go there. Okay. Um, if there's another book that you all are interested in, then uh, hit me up and maybe we will go, go there. So this, this Wednesday night, I did it because I'm, uh, the Facebook page was messing up last night broadcast. And Evangelist Frazier allowed Pastor to pull a rank and say, okay, I'm going to put you off Evangelist Frazier until next month because next Wednesday night, um, and Pat was scheduled to come on, but I, I kind of pulled a rank on her uh, because I need to get this done. And uh, so she will teach next month, um, um, next Wednesday night at this time on this broadcast. Uh, thank you. Uh, evangelist Teresa will do the teaching. Habeka, my not one. Why in the world you want to go to the Old Testament book of? Has somebody heard a man say Habeka? And Habeka may be the book. <laughs> I've always called it Habeka, but I call he he, he called it Habeka, and I said, hey, your your guess is as good as mine. Uh, and then the last Wednesday, uh, Reverend Stokes is going to do the teaching, okay? Wednesday night will come from this Facebook page. Tuesday night will still be on my page. That way you don't have to go searching for different preachers, okay? I guess that's Janie uh, representing Mount Vernon Baptist Church and telling you how you can register. Um, um, we're going to have next Sunday, we're going to have um, um, School Spirit Day. Uh, as we get ready to go, I, I tell you what, let's do school spirit the first Sunday. The first Sunday next month, we uh, uh, everybody wear their college or high school uh, uh, gear. Okay, I'm gonna have on my Razorback gear, and uh, so in uh, 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 so we, we it just doing something. Okay, it ain't spiritual. It ain't, it ain't they're gonna do spirituality. Okay, but if you are comfortable on the first Sunday wearing your school spirit gear. Um, as we get ready to kick off this football season, then on the first Sunday, we're, we're going to come in our um, gear, okay? Those are ways you can give uh, until Sunday morning, 9 o'clock. Uh, to, to our friends in Montgomery, the fourth Sunday, I'll be doing my pastor's anniversary at the, Be at the Bethel Missionary Baptist Church during the 10 o'clock service. So um, all of, uh, for all of our friends in, in uh, Montgomery, uh, I don't get out very often. Uh, last Sunday, I was at uh, Mount Olive in Shorter. Thank y'all. Boy, we had a great time at Mount Olive. Fourth Sunday, I'll be at Bethel at my home church doing my pastor's anniversary. So all of our friends in and around Montgomery meet us at Bethel Baptist Church, 10 o'clock. Okay. Um, until next time, until Sunday morning at 9. As-salamu peace, y'all.